Hello everyone, glad you could make it today. Surprise, we're going to be building the Darabalda today instead of the Faract. I realize that I've said in previous episodes of this build series that I'm going in sequential order, but the Darabalda is a great looking design, so hopefully you aren't too disappointed by me switching things up a little. This is a kit I've been looking forward to building ever since it arrived in the mail last December, so let's crack open the box and get to work. Inside the box are three runners for the Darabald itself, which is a surprisingly small number. You also get some small translucent ones for the beam effect parts. This kit is notable for including two different beam effect colors, having the standard green shared with the Delanza kits, as well as purple, which I've never seen before. You also get a small stand, some wire, and a sticker sheet. The build quality was nothing unexpected and up to the same high standard set by kits such as the Luminous and Aerial, although there is definitely less going on. It may not have an inner frame, but this kit is still a good one. The shoulder shields can articulate in two directions and the overall posability is fantastic. It has double joints in the arms, which is always something I feel compelled to mention. Double arm joints remind me of Origin Zaku's, which is a good thing, considering the Origin Zaku is in my top 5 kits. I don't know, I just love seeing double arm joints. Best of all, there is no need for seam line removal on the thighs, something I can't say for the rest of Jaturk suits. Even the Lubris has seam lines on the thighs. The kit hides its seam lines very well and incorporates the visible ones into recessed panel detail. And there's an open hand part. Not even the aerial comes with an open hand part. Overall, I really like this kit. It fixes the issues present in the Delanza and looks great out of the box. There is less technology in the kit compared to the aerial, but the design of the Darabald itself gives the kit extra points in my book. It looks fantastic, goes together painlessly, hides all the seam lines, and can hold a large number of poses as well. I don't want to say it's my favorite in this lineup just because I have more to work through, but it's a very strong contender. But now, it's time to start painting. I primed with Mr. Surfacer 1000 and sprayed a coat of Tamiya TS100 Semi-Gloss Bright Gunmetal. This kit eats up even more paint than the Delanzas. I went through an entire 35ml can of Surfacer. I'll probably switch back to the finishing surfacer after this build. It is double the cost, but the black covers the plastic color more easily and can act as shadows if I miss any. It's a worthy investment. I'm starting off painting with all of those pipes and the curved detail on the chest. I figured it would be best to start with the most tedious bits before I forget them while painting the colors I actually want to. I'm using a light grey, which is a color choice for pipes that I like helping them stand out from the rest of the colors, but it's not too out there. Usually, I would start off painting with the frame using some shade of grey, but I'm leaving the frame metallic. The Daryl Balda is described as a sort of test unit, and having more of the metallic undercoat visible fits this idea in my opinion and helps it stand out in a subtle way. It's time to paint the chest, and if you're starting to feel a sense of deja vu with these colors, it's for a reason. They're the exact same as the ones I've used on the Delanzas. In the standard Delanza video, I talked about having a shared color palette with mobile suits from the same in-universe companies, which I'm continuing. There is a bit of a drawback to this idea, which is me not being able to use a dark brown like this on any other suits in this lineup. It's a shame, since I really like this color. There are two iterations of this dark brown which I've used so far. One has more grey and one has less grey. I painted the one with more grey on the standard Delanzas while the one with less grey went on Gwell's Delanza. I'm using the one with less grey for two reasons, to continue the theme from Gwell's Delanza and because the smaller amount of grey seems like a better choice for what the Darabalda is, a test unit showcasing the newest technology offered by Jaturk Heavy Industries. It's like a concept car but in robot form. This color also goes on the waist accents and the extra forearms that go on the backpack. And I'm painting those boxes on the chest. They seem a little different from the ones on the Delanza and seem related to the AI on the Darabalda instead of the Vulcans on the Delanza, so they probably wouldn't be the same color, but I like the shared visual language. Green-gray is also just a solid color and adds a real-world military feel to these robot models. 
The backpack is painted German gray, which pairs nicely with dark brown. It's time to paint the main red. Just like on the Delanzas, this color scheme is going to be pretty similar to how the Darabalda appears in the anime, with a few small changes. When I first saw this design, I thought it looked like a devil, and really wanted to lean into this theme. Since I'm leaving a lot more parts metallic, I have to be more careful than usual. Whenever I paint on the underside of a surface, I have to make sure that the paintwork has a consistent edge. However, this does give me a bit of freedom since I can establish these edges myself. While working on this project, I actually remembered to buy some new brushes and started putting them to use. You'll first see them when I start painting the arms and are in number 5 round. But I came to the realization that I like the used brush better. Because it's older, the sharp point has become more of a wedge and creates much more even coverage. Each brush stroke is less angular and aggressive which makes it easier to blend. I did consider using filbert brushes instead of rounds, while a filbert brush has the wider tip, which is better for coverage, the general wedge shape means a less precise result. So until I find a brush which is perfect right after buying it, I'll have to stick the old brush, or break in the brushes myself. I think my problem comes with the amount of adhesive put on the brush to help keep its point. As soon as I get rid of that, I'll have exactly what I'm looking for. I really did need to get new brushes though. Up until me buying these new ones, I only had a single one for painting on base coats. As a color, I like Vallejo's normal red the best. It's so much smoother than all the other reds they offer, at least the lighter shades. Their darker reds are pretty solid all around. I wanted a slightly darker red to both break up the main red color and create a bit of a transition between that first red and some of the future colors. I'm treating color placement identically to other accents I've done in the past, painting it on the elbows and knees. The legs are being painted the same brown color as on the chest. This makes the Darabaldo look like it's wearing tall boots and is something I picked up from the Schwalbe Grey's Cyclass custom. I just figured I'd put it out there before anyone in the comments does. It's a cool look so I have no problem copying it. I think brown is a severely underrated color and whenever I've got the chance to use it on a build, I'll take it. Since this brown has some blue thrown in the mixture, it'll also help balance out the massive amount of red. I'm using German Grey again for the feet. I needed something darker than the brown to give the feet some visual weight and this dark grey is a perfect color. To prepare for some future areas, I'm using black which I rarely ever use. In previous videos, I've talked about how I never use black to paint black, opting for a dark grey instead. I mainly use this color on the head, but also on the areas where the clear parts go. At this point, I was still undecided on using the stickers. I like the look of the metallic green, but it might be too busy. At least the black gives me the option to have these sensors look deactivated if I don't use the stickers. The crest on the head reminded me of a halo, so I thought it appropriate to add some gold on the area I painted black. The method I'm using is one I'm doing for the literal first time, not even any tests. I'll give a more detailed description as I have more experience, but what it basically comes down to is using silver ink and tinting it with sepia ink to get a gold color. The color underneath really affects how the color turns out. Using black as an undercoat made the gold seem quite pale in certain lighting. I really like how this looks and am pretty annoyed that none of it was in focus. You'll probably be seeing a lot more of this technique in the future though. I wanted to paint the sensor gold, at least in part. I wanted the gold to look like it was glowing, so I painted orange underneath. I then painted roughly the same gold mixture on top. I say roughly because I'm focusing more on the general concept instead of specific numbers. The bottom half of the sensor needs to be green. I start off by painting some steel first and finishing it with some fluorescent green. The paint is somewhat transparent and the result looks like tinted glass, and to think I was seriously considering the stickers. 
The finished sensor looks so good. It kind of makes me want to go back and redo all the sensors on the Delanzas. It's just a shame that all of this video was blurry. I sprayed a coat of Mr. Super Clear Semi Gloss and to me a PS53 Lame Flake. I wanted the Daryl Balda to feel a bit more premium than the mass produced Delanza and the holographic specs in the Lame Flake work well for this. After letting things dry for a couple of hours, I started to apply decals. As usual, these decals are from G Rework and are absolutely fantastic. G Rework has been on a roll lately since they're actually making decal sets for these Witch from Mercury kits as they come out. As usual, this decal set comes with some numbered decals as well as some unnumbered ones, which are more multi-purpose general markings for you to use as you like and really make the kit your own. But this set lends itself to originality even more than usual since there aren't any marking instructions on the G Rework website. What I end up doing is using the product images as a rough guideline. In past videos, I have said that G Rework's decals are a little tackier than Delpy's and don't move around as easily. But I learned that this was my fault since I didn't leave enough water on the decals, which meant they had a harder time separating from the paper. This may sound like a rookie mistake, but the way I do decals for videos is cut out all of the decals associated with one part of the model, soak them in water, and use a paper towel to remove a lot of the water to avoid the decals from floating off the decal paper or getting mixed up. After realizing this and fixing my mistake, the process went together smoothly. This was a pretty solid 4 hour session, and all of the decals coupled with the holographic flakes make the suit seem like a race car. It's interesting how many of my Witch from Mercury kits get paint jobs which are sort of reminiscent of real world machines. My Lubris was painted to look like a vintage military aircraft, the Begra Bale looks like a stealth fighter, the Ariel looks like a space shuttle, and this one looks like a race car. I'm doing some physical chipping. The chipping is extremely light, possibly the lightest chipping both in this build series and overall. This decision was made based on several factors, the main one being the lamb flake and how noisy of an effect it is. My usual chipping just wouldn't be seen. Since I want some sort of chipped effect, I focus on edge wear, using the back end of a hobby knife to scrape at the edges and reveal the metallic. When doing edge wear, it's important not to scrape off an entire edge, but reveal it in bits and pieces, at least if you're concerned about realistic effects. I prefer physical chipping to painting on chipped effects. Not only is it easier to do, you don't need to worry about the amount of paint on a brush or if you're using the right brush or brush stroke for the effect you want, it also creates an in-scale result. And if you're concerned with realism, there's no chipping effect more realistic than actually chipping your paint. It's also just a super fun technique, it's my favorite weathering step for a reason. I always enjoy getting the chance to just attack the paintwork and decals I was so careful in applying earlier. If there's any technique where you can just take out your frustrations, it would be physical chipping. It's time for a pin wash, which is something I was completely fine with not doing for a month. But I consider a pin wash essential, even if it is really tedious. This is just a pre-made black acrylic wash, I prefer the pre-made stuff to making my own, because the result is more consistent, and it actually behaves how I want it to. It flows into detail but not out of it, flooding the model surface. On a similar note, I try not to add any water to the wash to keep the consistency consistent. A pin wash is a technique that just transforms the look of a model. In my experience, after you learn how to do it, you can never go back. By creating fake shadows, all of the kit's detail pops out at you and creates a more lifelike result. I'm also using the wash to shade details, darkening them which makes them look like they're further away from you than the surroundings. Just another thing which adds to the dimensionality of a model. After all, these Witch from Mercury kits have lots of great detail to highlight, it would be a shame if it all went unnoticed. I also remembered to buy some new brushes, these really made the entire process so much smoother. Unlike in previous projects, I had to do barely any cleanup, which makes the pin wash process such a chore. A lot of people recommend applying a pin wash over a slightly glossy surface. 
I'm generally part of that group as the glossy surface helps the wash flow into the details easier, but it can be done over a flat finish. The result is just messier and you'll have more cleanup to do. Depending on the subject matter, you might prefer a messier look, but since this is 1 to 144 scale, I prefer the neater appearance. Although I was perfectly fine with how things looked after the pin wash, I felt a little weird calling the build done at that point, so now I'm just adding a light patina. This is a dark brown wash mixture that I'll speckle all over the model, then vertically streak off the majority of it with a flat brush. I'm keeping this super light since I don't want a repeat of what happened on Gwell's Lanza. The patina made the pearl clear almost unrecognizable. But a patina is an effortless way of adding some age to a model. You can use it on its own or use it as a base for further weathering. It can even help unify colors together and create a more cohesive look. And after this dries, I'll spray some Mr. Premium Top Coat Semi Gloss. As usual, the final thing to work on is the weapon. I'm glad there's only one. I was originally going to go with red, but there's so much of it already. German Grey is a good alternative. I'm also sanding the effect parts with 1200 grit sandpaper, which makes the parts look like they're glowing instead of just being clear. It also doesn't impact how the clear parts react with UV light. If the part glows under UV light before sanding, it'll glow under UV light after. If you only have lower grits of sandpaper, 800 grit works too, anything coarser and you might remove too much material. But that is an added benefit, you can remove the mold lines. And when I'm finished sanding, the build is done. Here's how the Darabalda looks built up in the bare plastic. And here's how it looks like after a little work. You know how waiting makes things better? This kit was definitely worth the wait. My approach was very simple, even simpler than usual, but the simplicity is made up for with the design of the Darabald itself, decals, and especially that holographic flake. This was a great kit to return to painting with, and hopefully it was worth the wait for y'all. As usual, this isn't meant to be an explicit statement on what you should be doing with your own Gumpla, but instead a look into my own process. Feel free to use any of these techniques or colors in your own builds. Next in the series is the Gundam Fract. Finally, right? If you're waiting to see me paint this kit, I apologize. I didn't feel like painting something that complicated after being gone for a month and I was waiting on some decals but I'm more than ready to paint it now. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, consider supporting the channel. And as usual, I'll be seeing you in the next video, whenever that is.